Hello everyone, I'm Gaurav Vishal, consultant at Wolfram Technology Group and today we'll discuss how Wolfram language can be used for material science application. Here are the outlines of my presentation. First, we will discuss built-in Wolfram language function to extract curated physical and chemical properties of elements and molecules, which would include element data function, chemical data, molecule function, uh, lattice data. And then uh, we would discuss about image feature detection method available in Mathematica, which would include examples for calculating size distribution of nanoparticle, calculating phase fraction in microstructure. Then we would discuss important partial differential equations in material science and their solution. We would see how we can solve diffusion problem and uh, heat transfer problem. At the end, we will discuss about finite element programming. We would take up example of modeling phase change in materials. Now let's discuss element data in Wolfram language. Uh, element data provides physical and chemical properties of uh, 180 elements which are present in periodic table. Here you can see element data returns a uh, list of uh, element entities uh, which are available in Mathematica and total count is 118. Element data properties returns a list of available properties. We get properties like atomic radii, boiling point, lifetime, Young's modulus and whatnot. Uh, it gives almost all the properties that we need in material science. Uh, similarly, suppose we want to calculate uh, atomic weight of oxygen, we can do so by passing atomic weight as a second argument. Here you can see get, we get the both magnitude and unit. Precision of the atomic weight calculated is five. So, and we can also get thermal conductivity, electronegativity, stable isotope, electronic configuration, crystal structure, and all the other uh, properties mentioned over here for uh, the, all the elements which are available in Mathematica. Now let's discuss about chemical data in Wolfram language. Uh, chemical data provides data for uh, more than 80K molecules uh, and these are drawn from uh, these sources. And now, uh, just like ele uh, element data, we get a lot of properties with chemical data as well and total count of these properties are 100. And so here, here are a few examples where we are calculating this property. So suppose for benzene, we want to compute combustion heat, uh, atom position, molar mass, alternate standard names, IUPAC names, we get all of them using this function. Now, uh, molecule function in Wolfram language. Uh, molecule uh, function is a low label uh, entity function in Mathematica, which converts any uh, given a molecule to a molecule entity. So here, suppose we have boragene, which is also known as inorganic benzene. And suppose we pass it as argument to molecule function, it will convert it as entity. Now, which we, uh, this molecule entity, we can use to uh, plot it using molecule plot, or maybe you can find uh, molecule uh, properties as well. So here we are uh, uh, trying to plot the uh, boragene. Uh, and we have got uh, different themes available in Mathematica, all atom, heavy atom, aromatic, uh, monochrome. And here are the results. Now, suppose we want to get the atom list of all this, uh, of the origin molecule, we can do by uh, function atom list. And uh, for the bond list, we can use bond list function. Uh, also notice that uh, uh, the type of bond will be uh, presented in the second argument. So here, it, uh, all of the bond were single, so it's single here. Now we can create molecule for systematic chemical name as well. So here we had a chemical name and uh, if you pass that to the molecule function, it will construct a molecule entity for the same. Uh, we can construct the molecule plot for this molecule here. And suppose we want to highlight a carbon fluorine bond uh, in this one. So we can do so by using patterns. So in molecule plot, uh, here we have a pattern of uh, bond between C and F. So, and since, since we had three bonds from C and F, it has highlighted these three bonds with different colors over here. Uh, so suppose we want to construct a molecule uh, from scratch and uh, we want to define atom and the bond list, we can do so by using molecule function. So first we'll need to pass the uh, list of atoms. So here we are constructing H2O molecule and so OHH uh, are passed as atom and we'll need to uh, define the bond. Uh, so here bond between O and H is single. So we have defined accordingly. And now we get a molecule entity and basically we can use this for any computation. Uh, now, suppose we want to replace uh, oxygen, uh, oxygen element with sulfur. So we can do so by using replace atom uh, argument of uh, molecule modified function. 
and since here oxygen was at position one we can specify replace one with sulfur and it basically reconstructs the new molecule now we can compute the molecule properties as well so just like uh, element data and um, chemical data we can compute the properties for the constructed molecules over here so these are the different properties which we can compute so in the last slide molecule 3 was defined as water so molar mass we can compute using uh, uh, molecular mass uh, argument and which comes out to be 18.015 u suppose we want to compute the geometric properties we can do the same thing by using molecule value function so here are the geometric properties of uh, h2o molecule that we have defined in the previous slide now suppose we want to define a stereochemistry chemistry element so just just like we passed uh, atom list and bond list now we'll have to define the stereochemistry elements here so here uh, in the stereochemistry element for this particular molecule we are defining a stereotype as tetrahedral and chiral center as two and direction is uh, counter clockwise direction and suppose now we want to uh, find the atom, atom chirality of this particular molecule we can do so by passing atom chirality and we get s configuration and suppose we want to con uh, convert this uh, molecule to uh, to its enantiomer so basically we'll have to change the direction from counterclockwise direction to clockwise direction and we get a updated molecule so you can notice that the projection has changed over here now uh, we can compute the uh, molecule plot of this one and we can see that now this uh, has changed to our configuration so from s we have got the r configuration now we have also got molecule recognized function in Mathematica, so which takes an image and basically constructs molecule from that one. So uh, here we are passing a very big image, which has got like a lot of carbon atoms. And we pass this image to image uh, molecule recognized fu function and we get molecule of this particular uh, image. And after this molecule entity has been uh, computed, we can uh, pass that to molecule value and get all the properties that we want. So here I'm uh, calculating the molar mass of this particular uh, molecule. Uh, we can also use built-in molecule function to construct uh, reconstruct the molecule from this image. So uh, we have got the nice looking uh, molecule plot over here. Now we, uh, Mathematica supports import and exports formats uh, for this chemical. Uh, so we have SDF, XYZ, CIF, HIN, CML, FC, HK, Cube, all this uh, different import and export formats. So here you can see I have a CML file of toluene and from if, uh, if we import this, we get the molecular entity uh, from this particular CML file. And we can construct a molecule plot again and similarly suppose we want to get the metadata of this cml file we can uh, do so by passing it as second argument uh, lattice data in wolfram from language just like uh, element data we have got a uh, like a lot of lattice data here so basically all the available lattice data uh, is available using this function so and also for each and uh, each of this lattice data, we can get different properties. So we can get alternate names, bases, classes, and whatnot. And also we get the nice looking images of all this lattice. So suppose we want to compute uh, alternate names of FCC, face-centered cubic, we get FCC. Suppose we want to get packing radius, we can do so, we can get the density as well. Now we'll discuss uh, calculating size distribution of nanoparticles. But before that, uh, uh, I'd like to discuss like uh, in material science, we often deal with like microscopy image, uh, be it optical microscopy image or transmission electron microscopy image. And there are a lot of uh, feature extraction uh, involved. Like we want to calculate the size, particle size, grain size, phase, fraction, et cetera. Uh, Mathematica has built in functions to transform image and calculate features. So we'll be discussing all of those over here. Now, suppose we want to distribute, uh, find the size distribution of nanoparticle. Here I'm using a transmission electron microscopy image of uh, iron oxide nanoparticle, which is coated with mesoporous silica. And so 
you, you can see the image is quite complicated. Uh, there are particles which are on the boundary as well, and there are small particles as well. So in order to get the uh, distribution, we'll first need to clean this uh, image. So first we'll need to binarize this image so that we get all the pixel values in zero and one. So for that, we'll need to use binarize function. Now we need to color negate so that the black pixel is converted to white and white to black. And then we have got a morphological component function, which basically uh, uh, makes this image ready for the computation. And uh, once we have done that, we can delete the bond, uh, boundary atoms or particles by using a delete border uh, component function. And after we have applied that, you can see that uh, we have gotten rid of all the particles that were pre present on the boundary or were sliced. So we have got a clean image over here. Now suppose we have got, uh, so here you can see that we have got a lot of uh, small particles uh, which will hinder our results. So that's why we will need to clean this. So for that we can basically use delete small component function which will clean those up. Now for the measurement, we have got a component measurement function. Uh, and here we need to find the radii of this particle so that we can compute the distribution. So component measurement, and then we are passing equivalent disk radii as the argument. So basically this will compute uh, the equivalent disk radii of each of these particles over here, and we get the result. Now, since uh, the results are in the pixel value, we now need to use this scale over here to uh, compute the actual size. So for that uh, we'll reuse the image so basically this one and so here we have this uh, scale with white color so we'll find the white pixel over here so uh, you can see i'm calculating the white white pixel from uh, over here and which comes out to be like 100 uh, nanometer scale bar is about 40 pixel in length so basically we'll convert the equivalent uh, disk radii to uh, equivalent disk radii in nanometer and these are the results that we get now we can calculate the particle size use uh, we, we can compute histogram of this one and it comes out to be like most of the particles are between 20 to 40 nanometers so and this was the uh, expected result that we 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 expected now calculating phase fraction in microstructure uh, just like uh, particle size, we here uh, we have got uh, white cast iron. Uh, here we have the optical microscopy image. Uh, in the earlier slide, we had a uh, uh, transmission electron microscope image. Uh, so what we'll need to do is first we'll need to convert this uh, image to a black and white pixel. For that, we'll need binarize function, and again we'll need to color negate uh, this image. Uh, also, like uh, here we want to co compute the the black portion which is the carbide over here so for so that's why we are converting that to the uh, white pixels and uh, so for the measurement we have got two methods one is like by pixel count we can basically use uh, image data function to compute the pixels uh, which will be in zero and one values and we can compute the uh, count of the uh, pixels that are in black and white so here we get the pixel tally. So uh, you can see like we, we have got the distribution of zero and one. Now in order to compute the percent cementite, we'll need to uh, basically divide the uh, pixel of uh, one uh, by pixel total pixels. So basically here uh, we need to define uh, divide that. We get uh, the percentage to be 0 0.51. And now suppose, uh, now we have got another method, which is component measurement, which we, we had used in the uh, earlier slides. So we first we'll need to convert this to morphological components. And then here also like we need to clean the small components because there were uh, there are a lot of uh, particles in this one. And then we can basically compute the equivalent area. So in earlier slide, you had seen that we, were, we had used equivalent disk radii. Now we'll need to use area and which comes out to be one, two, seven, three, six, one uh, and uh, equivalent percent cementite comes out to 0 0.50, which is almost same as 0 0.51 that we got by pixel count method. Now using your liver rule, we can compute the percentage of carbon in the image. And 
So basically, it comes out to be 3.62. So it comes out that it's hypoeutectic uh, white crust iron. Solving PDs. So in uh, material science, we have uh, got, we mostly deal with uh, a partial differential equation, which are of the second order and which, which almost looks like this. So for uh, uh, this kind of uh, partial differential equation for the, uh, follows second order differential equation with respect to X and almost of the time X is dis distance in material science. Uh, boundary conditions, we mostly used uh, Dechlet boundary condition, which uh, specify the condition at the boundary. And sometimes we use Newman uh, boundary condition, which is specify the uh, derivative of the solution at the boundary. And in Mathematica, uh, we have got Dirichlet condition, which uh, basically takes the value uh, at a particular condition, uh, a particular boundary condition. And so similarly, we can use Newman value for defining uh, the, the uh, derivative value at the boundary condition. I will discuss this in detail in the next sections. So solving second order partial differential equations, that is heat and diffusion equation. So heat equation uh, looks like dou u by dou t equal to k dou square u by dou x square. And in, when written in Mathematica, we can write it in this form. Now, uh, similarly, the diffusion equation also looks same, uh, only the replacement is k changes to d and the uh, heat here changes to the concentration. Uh, sim uh, similarly, like suppose we have diffusion with first order chemical reaction coupled with that one. So basically we'll have to introduce a second term, which is minus KCXT. And suppose we have a diffusion convection equation, we'll have this uh, term added to that one. Uh, uh, in case of spherical diffusion, the diffusion equation looks like this. So uh, we have formulated all the diffusion equation. Now this diffusion equation can be used for solving uh, diff on different modeling, different heat and diffusion problems. So we'll discuss over here. So suppose we have one day heat transfer problem. So we'll use the heat equation, uh, which was defined in this earlier slide as well. And for solving this differential equation, we'll need at least one uh, initial condition and two uh, boundary condition. So in this case, uh, we want to get uh, uh, the solution. So basically we'll have to use either D solve value or ND solve value. So here we want to do the symbolic com uh, computation. So we are using D solve value and we are passing the heat equation and the initial condition. So we get the solution. And after that, we can plot it, plot the solution uh, using plot function. And here, once we had the equation, we had to uh, basically define uh, the T value and the X value. So here with the table value, we are defining the T values from zero to uh, five. So each different uh, plot uh, correspond to different time value and uh, on X axis, we have X values uh, defined over here. Uh, now suppose uh, in the initial condition, uh, we want it to be piecewise function. We can use unit box for that one. And similarly, we can solve the function. So we get a solution in uh, respect to error function and the uh, equivalent uh, plot looks like this. Uh, for solving 3D heat transfer problem, we'll uh, need to uh, rearrange the uh, equation. So we'll have the equation in three dimension, uh, but the order will be same. And so once we have that, we'll need to define the equation. So equation looks like this. And once that's ready, we'll need to define the initial condition. So here we'll have initial condition of uh, like at time t equal to zero, the temperature is 304 Kelvin. And then we'll need to define the boundary conditions. So, so on the x-axis, uh, y-axis and z-axis, all of them. So here we have boundary condition on x and y and z defined. And now we can use the ND solve value to solve the equation. Once the, we get the res result, it will be interpolating function, which can be used to uh, create plots. So now we uh, get the plot of the 3D heat transfer problem over here. And here we are using contour as 294. Similarly, we can use different contours. And here we have sliced uh, the plot so that we can see what's going on inside this. And for more details on solving partial differential equation, uh, you can refer to this article.
Now I'll move on to one dimensional diffusion problem, which is which follows the same equation as the heat equation. So, uh, and basically the solution is almost same. Uh, I wanted to pick this problem because uh, I wanted to discuss more about boundary conditions. So here, suppose we have initial value of concentration as zero and boundary condition uh, as a sinusoidal value. So we can define that. Now, once we get the result, uh, the result is in sinusoidal form, but suppose we wanted it to be uh, have periodic boundary conditions. So in that case, we, we needed to define the boundary conditions as that it follows periodic boundary conditions. So in the previous section, we had boundary condition as like at uh, x equal to zero, it was following sin t, but x, at x equal to one, it was following uh, zero. But now here we have changed it to at zero, it's sin t. And again, when uh, it basically complete one, cycle of two pi then again it becomes sine t so this kind of period uh, condi boundary condition is known as periodic boundary condition and here you can see that the result repeats itself and it will uh, keep on going now i'd like to discuss about file finite element programming uh, basically here i'll be modeling phase change now uh, like as you see, uh, saw in the earlier section, ND solve value provides a high level uh, one step process for solving partial differential equation. However, in some cases, we would want to control the steps of the solution process with, uh, process with more details. The ND solve uh, value FEM package provides a low level interface that gives uh, extensive control for each part of the solution process. So, uh, so some of the material science problem, uh, in some of the material science problem, we'll need to have uh, more controls on uh, the steps involved so that we can uh, basically find out the result. So for this section, we'll, be, uh, we'll need to load the FEM package, which we can do by using needs. And for solving this kind of problem, we'll need uh, to do it in three stages, like initialization, discretization, and solving. Now coming to this actual problem, phase change in material. So phase change basically follows nonlinear heat equation, uh, which uh, looks like this, where uh, T is the temperature, uh, rho is the density. Then we have uh, CP value, which is temperature dependent on also K value, which is temperature dependent. And since these two values are temperature dependent, it uh, makes it more complicated because it makes it uh, the system as a transient with nonlinear transient co coefficient. So in order to uh, keep the things simple here, we'll be modeling in one dimension only. So we'll have to assume the phase change from uh, one phase to the next phase uh, follows a smooth transition function. So here we are considering, suppose uh, we have a solid um, phase, which is getting changed to the liquid phase. So what will happen is uh, the CP value and KT value will drop suddenly when there will be a phase change. So here we are smoothening it by using this smooth end step function. So basically uh, before zero, it uh, it's one. And after it has the phase change has occurred, it will value drops to zero. And now here we are setting up the nonlinear coefficients and the parameters. So KT value and CP value we get from here. And once that's done, then we'll need to specify the domain. So here we are considering that the size is from zero to 0 0.1. And there is a constant inflow of energy from one side and there is a constant temperature maintained on the other end. So in order to uh, specify the domain, we will basically use line function here. So we have line from zero to 0 0.01. Uh, boundary condition on the left uh, boundary, there is constant inflow of energy and on the right boundary, there is fixed temperature, as I said. Uh, so we will need to define the boundary condition. So uh, boundary condition on left, uh, we can use Newman value of uh, 5000. We are taking some approximate value over here. And for the uh, right boundary condition, we are taking temperature equal to minus 10 when x equal to 0 0.01. Now we will need to uh, set up numerical region. So basically the the region that we defined of line will have to convert it to numerical region. So for that, we need to use a two numerical region function. And similarly, for uh, we'll need to define the uh, VD and SD. So we'll need to use uh, variable data and solution data. So for variable data, we'll use uh, dependent variables. Uh, so will be temperature and then space is X and time is T. 
And similarly for the solution data, space will be the, the numerical region that we defined and time we are taking as zero. Now we'll need to initialize the uh, PD. Uh, so initial coefficient, uh, PD coefficient, we uh, compute using uh, VD that we had in the previous slide. SD and then diffuse for the diffusion coefficient, we are using the uh, KT, uh, K value, which is temperature dependent. And then damping coefficient, we are using CP value, uh, which is also a temperature dependent value. For initial boundary condition, we are using uh, boundary condition on left and boundary condition on right. And method of the evaluation will be finite element and met, uh, mesh option. We are taking as uh, maxill measure of uh, 0.01 by 50. And uh, now we need to uh, compute the stationary component. For this, we'll need to use discretized PD function. So basically here we are passing the fourth argument as stationary. So in order, uh, so initial coefficient method uh, data and then SD. And for uh, stationary boundary conditions, we'll uh, basically use discretized boundary condition function. And again, we'll use stationary as the uh, for the uh, argument over here. So once we have that, now we'll need to come uh, initialize the value. So I, uh, we need to set the initial condition. And we knew that the initial condition was that like temperature on the right hand boundary condition was minus 10. So we are setting it uh, to that. Now we'll need to discretize the part uh, PDE at each step, each step. So basically we'll need to create a function for that. So here is the function which does that. So here we already have SDP, SBC, which were values for the stationary values. Now there will be, uh, we'll need to compute the transient and uh, nonlinear part of the partial differential equation as well. So for that we are using, uh, so uh, for that we are using uh, this uh, discretized PD with the fourth argument as transient. And over here we have nonlinear. And at, uh, like it, at each step we are just uh, adding the stationary value, transient value, and nonlinear value. And at the end, we are deploying the boundary condition so that we get the final boundary condition. So once this function is ready, we can use this for the solution. So in order to solve this function, we'll be using ND solve value and basically the function that we created and initial condition that we had defined. And method will be equation simplification. And uh, basically we'll keep the, um, keep monitoring the value as well. So we get the, uh, the value of uh, T fun. And once this, we have got the interpolating function, uh, we'll have to convert this to uh, interpolating function so that we can use that. So for that, we'll uh, need to uh, make this conversions. And once this conversion is done, we can visualize the solution by basically animating the result. Uh, here we are calculating the results for 30 frame. And so the result looks something like this. So uh, at time t equal to zero, uh, there will be nothing. And once the time keeps on changing, you will see that uh, the, the temperature changes. And uh, here at, at the this point, there is a phase change going on. So there is a uh, change in the slope of the curve. Uh, so basically once this is model, you modeled, you can basically compute the time which will be required to uh, complete phase change and all. Uh, for details on uh, finite element program, you can refer to this documentation. Uh, since we don't have much time, I'd like to finish my presentation. These are the references uh, for the images, uh, micrographs that were used in this slide. And Thank you uh, for listening.